When we talk about antibacterials, the step one is really going to expect you to know what are the key targets for antibacterial treatment and why do we construct antibiotics that work a certain way against bacteria. So the key things we have to know is that, you know, we can target things for, for cell wall formation. That's either the synthesis of the peptidoglycan or the cross-linking of the subunits. We can disrupt the plasma cell membranes directly. We can block the nucleotide synthesis required for making DNA and RNA. We can actually block enzymes involved in DNA processing directly. We can block enzymes involved in RNA processing, as well as the enzymes and ribosomal subunits for the production of proteins. So we have all these targets, and we've got lots of different drugs that work on each of these targets. So we're going to try to focus on a couple of the key features of each of them, because, you know, there's just a ton of stuff to know about each drug. When we talk about antibacterials, we have to have a couple of words in our lingo. So we talk about the difference between bacteriostatic and bactericidal. Bacteriostatic just means that it keeps the bacterial population static. So it inhibits further growth. It allows the immune system time to catch up to get the total infection under wraps. In general, bacteriostatic drugs are the ones that work on protein synthesis and nucleotide synthesis. There are some exceptions to that, but that's a nice principle to keep in mind. Bactericidal drugs, on the other hand, they actually kill the bacteria directly. It causes something that either increases toxic metabolites in the cell or something that ruptures the cell membrane or cell wall, which causes osmotic lysis of the cell. So in general, these are drugs that work on the cell wall or that work on DNA processing of some kind. Lastly, we're going to talk about spectrum. When we describe spectrum, we want to know, does a drug work on gram positives? Does it work on gram negatives? Does it work on anaerobes? And does it work on atypical bacteria, for example, mycoplasma and chlamydia and things like that? So with that little introduction, we're going to start talking about cell wall antibiotics. These include the beta-lactam antibiotics, and the beta-lactam antibiotics are so named because chemically they have a ring known as the beta-lactam ring. These include the penicillins, the cephalosporins, and the carbapenems. And other cell wall antibiotics include astreonam, which is a monobactam, it's, it's structurally different, and vancomycin, which is also structurally different. So when we talk about penicillin, we have to know that there's the IV formulation, which is penicillin G, and there's the oral formulation, which is the penicillin V. I think the easiest way to remember that is just it goes with alphabetical order. IV comes before oral, right? I comes before O, and G comes before V. So penicillin G goes with IV, and penicillin V goes with oral. Penicillin works by binding to the PBPs, so named because it's penicillin binding proteins, which are required for the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan subunits. And therefore, it is a bactericidal drug because it causes lysis, osmotic lysis of the cell. The big thing to worry about with penicillins is penicillin allergies. Now, the allergies could be very minor. It could be a rash. It could progress to anaphylaxis. So if somebody tells you that they're pen allergic, you keep them away from penicillins and cephalosporins too, because there is some cross-reactivity with cephalosporins there as well. Within the penicillin subclass, there are other penicillin-like groups, which are actually derivatives of penicillin. And the thing that makes them different is that they have slightly different structural molecules, which allow them to be a little bit more resistant to beta-lactamases that is produced by staphylococcus. So these, which include methicillin, nafcillin, oxacillin, and dicloxacillin, these are a little bit more narrow spectrum. They're really used for what we call methicillin-sensitive staph aureus infections. Now, methicillin is not really used for antibiotics. It's really just used to culture and sensitivity reports, basically to find out, is this staph infection sensitive or not to methicillin? That tells you what antibiotic can you give. Are you going to use nafcillin, or are you going to go on to use vanco? So um, the thing we have to know is that, again, People who are penallergic are going to be allergic to these, so we have to worry about allergies to these antibiotics. And methicillin can cause interstitial nephritis, but again, likely it is that you're not going to be seeing methicillin given for an infection. Moving on, we're going to talk about ampicillin and amoxicillin. So you think ampicillin is an amped up penicillin. They are slightly wider spectrum. 
They are beta-lactamase sensitive, but they're typically combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. That includes clavulanic acid, sulbactam, and tazobactam. All of these inhibit the enzyme beta-lactamase, which some bacteria have. The inclusion of a beta-lactamase inhibitor actually allows a broader spectrum, which allows these to target gram-negatives as well as gram-positives. Ampicillin, by the way, is used for an IV formulation, whereas amoxicillin has got much greater oral bioavailability, so you can give that by mouth. Once again, we have to worry about hypersensitivity, and we also have to worry about pseudomembranous colitis from a C. diff infection. The next group of penicillin derivatives we're going to talk about are the ones used for pseudomonas infections. These include ticercillin, carbenicillin, and piperacillin. Very often, these are also combined with beta-lactamase inhibitors. For example, the drug which has the trade name Zosin is a pretty heavy-duty antibiotic. It's piperacillin combined with tazobactam. By the way, these are good not only for pseudomonas, but also for bacteroides infections, which is an anaerobe. So in terms of spectrum, these do have some anaerobic coverage. Next, we're going to talk about cephalosporins. We have the first generation covers gram-positives, so just write plus. The second generation covers gram-positives and a little bit of gram-negatives, so we could say plus-minus. The third generation is the widest spectrum. It's great gram-positive and great gram-negative coverage. So that's, you know, really, really good. Underline that, positive-negative. And the fourth generation is a little narrower. It's a little less on the gram-negative, but it does cover pseudomonas. So what do we have to know? First generation, it's good for skin flora. It's gram-positives only. But the reason that we use it is because it is great for surgical prophylaxis because it covers the strep and staph that we have in our skin. So when you see uh, ANSEF, which is a trade name for cephalexin, that's what is very commonly used for surgical prophylaxis. Second generation is a little bit wider spectrum. Third generation, like we said, is the widest spectrum. And, you know, we give, for example, um, ceftriaxone for gonorrhea. We also give ceftazidime, which does, in fact, cover pseudomonas. So this is the one exception. Not only does fourth generation cover pseudomonas, but ceftazidime, which is a third generation, it does cover pseudomonas as well. Fourth generation is a narrow spectrum, which we said covers pseudomonas. The adverse reactions are allergies. It does cross-react with penicillin in some 10% of cases. And it may cause a disulfiram reaction with alcohol ingestion. Basically, it means it causes extreme nausea and vomiting due to an increase in acetaldehyde levels after the consumption of alcohol. It also can increase the nephrotoxicity of aminoglycoside. The next cellul antibiotic is astrionam. It's structurally a little bit different. It does not have a beta-lactam ring. It is what we call a monobactam and is therefore resistant to beta-lactamase. It's also synergistic with aminoglycosides. That's something important to know. It is a very narrow spectrum. It is only for gram negatives. It does not cover gram positives and it does not cover anaerobes. It's generally well tolerated in terms of side effects. The next we're going to talk about are the carbapenems, which include imipenem and meropenem. These are, in general, pretty broad spectrum. They are very resistant to beta-lactamases. They're generally given with celastin. Celastin is a drug that decreases deactivation in the renal tubules. By the way, there is an analog. Penicillin is sometimes given with probenicid, which works similarly. This covers gram-positives, gram-negatives, and anaerobes, so very, very, very broad spectrum coverage. It does have significant side effects, so it is reserved for only very severe infections. It does, it does cross the blood-brain barrier, and it causes central nervous system toxicity, which will present as seizures. The last one we're going to talk about is vancomycin. Vancomycin is an enormous, enormous molecule, which means that if you take it orally, it does not get absorbed. It's good to know because you can give it for gastrointestinal infections and you know that it's going to get to where it needs to go in the GI tract. And that's why we give it for Clostridium difficile infections, C. diff. Is, the way it works, it binds the DALA, DALA, meaning, you know, dextroalanine, which is a target for cross-linking in peptidoglycan synthesis. Resistant bugs don't have DALA, DALA, they have DALA, DLAC. That's, uh, you know, dextroalanine, dextrolactose. It's very narrow spectrum. It's gram-positives only. And in general, we use it for MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, 
and Clostridium difficile, C. diff. Its adverse effects include nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, you know, it causes ringing in the ear and then deafness, and injection site reaction, that's, you know, uh, thrombophlebitis, it causes at the site of the vein where it's being injected, some kind of irritation, and it can cause a red man syndrome. Now, this is key to know about red man syndrome. It is not, I repeat, it is not an allergic reaction. The presence of red man syndrome does not contraindicate further use of vancomycin. What you have to do is two things. Give an antihistamine like Benadryl, diphenhydramine, or slow down the infusion rate, or do both. But it is not a contraindication to vancomycin. That's it for cell wall antibiotics.